What's up, y'all? Grandmaster Raven Sturt here, coming to you from the finest of living abodes, as you can tell. In this video, we're going to be looking at the greatest game ever played by a woman. This was played by Judith Polgar. Judith Polgar is the goat of women's chess, only woman to reach top 10. Uh, at the time, she broke the record for youngest ever Grandmaster for a woman at 15 years old, which is pretty incredible, though that record was later broken by Hoi Fan. And... Yeah, she's the only woman to ever cross the 2700 barrier. Her peak ranking was number 8. Her list of accomplishments can go goes on and on for pretty much all eternity. She's beaten Kasparov and Karpov in tournament play, which is also incredible. Uh, she called touch move on Karpov, which is another story in and of itself, and we'll, we'll get to that at some other point. And let's get to the game, though. This game is incredible. This game she played against the fiery Latvian superstar Alexei Shirov. So, before getting to the game, I just wanted to set the stage a bit better by showing who was in this tournament and what it was about. This tournament was a Sicilian-themed tournament. The organizers really wanted to have exciting chess, and for that reason, they they just hired all these these eight grandmasters to just come, come to Buenos Aires and play some extremely exciting, uh, critical, attacking chess. And look at who Polgar is playing with. This Polgar is truly the GOAT. She's playing with Ivanchuk, who's a legend. Anand, who is the former world champion, who only lost the world championship to Carlsen, to this the other GOAT. And literally every single player on this list is a legend. Every single player on this list is in the Chess Hall of Fame, as far as I can tell. Shirov, another great player. Shirov, we already talked about him. Kamsky was probably number three or four in the world for a very large part of the 90s. Karpov is the guy that succeeded Fisher. Salov is someone who you probably don't know of all the names on this list. Him and Lud Bojevic are probably the least known. They're both still in the Chess Hall of Fame. They're arguably in the top 10. Uh, I know for a very long time in the 90s, Salov was in the top 5, but he got on. He was on bad terms with Kasparov, and I think Kasparov got him blacklisted. That's what I understand. That's what the, uh, the Chess Underground says. So let's get to the game. So in this game, Shirov was white and Polgar was black. E4, C5, of course... By by the rules of the tournament, they have to, to play a Sicilian. Knight f3, e6, d4, takes, takes. Knight c6, knight c3, and d6. This is an interesting setup that Polgar is going for. Normally people look at this and they think that this is the Schwenigen, but actually it's not. The Schwenigen is with knight f6, not knight c6. This is a very weird setup. Um, back when I was trying to play e4 a lot earlier this year, I was struggling a lot against this setup. It's a very sneaky setup. As we're going to see, the knight is going to come to e7. G4, A6, Bishop E3, and the Knight comes to E7. Now, why did the Knight come to E7? Well, pretty much, White is about to be throwing these pawns forward on H4, F4, G4, G5, F5, H5, all that good stuff. And for that reason, we do not want this Knight to be here. When the Knight comes there, G5 is going to hit it like a sore thumb. Knight B3, B5. Of course, the Bishop has to come out here. The Bishop wants to scope down this long diagonal, breathing fire across the board. Bishop would not be good on d7. And yeah, pretty much when you put your pawn on e6, you're not setting your bishop up for a nice future on d7 or e6 or any other square. If you play e6 in any Sicilian, your bishop probably has to come to b7. That's just the rule. That's just the tricks of the trade. So f4, bishop b7, queen f3. And now all of a sudden, the game starts to see some really beautiful fireworks. Already here, Shirov is just going to play castles. He's going to throw his pawns forward with g5, h4, h5 all of that stuff. Polgar has no clear way to move this bishop out. Notice if Polgar plays something like g6, then white can quickly play for f5, and f5 is going to open up the f-file. Sheriff is just going to put a rook down there, completely survey the, the f-file, and get try to get the queen into the f7 square. This position just would get really uncomfortable. So instead, Shirov is going to get surprised with this one. Polgar has a really nice nifty trick planned Polgar needs to clear squares in the center for the knights. So look at what she does. She plays g5. Really beautiful move. If we look at Polgar's entire position here, her position would be immensely improved by getting that knight to e5. Look at that. The knight comes to e5. It hits g4. It hits f3. Bishop gets exposed. Everything is going well here. Um, but for that purpose, she needs to get rid of this f-pawn. And she does. She's going to just take. She's also got now this great square on g7 for the other bishop to peruse. And for that purpose... Everything is going well. Pretty much, she's going to get the knight to e5 no matter what now, because that pawn on f4 is coming off the board, so Shirov chooses to chop. He takes on g5. 
And now, you know, Polgar wants to put the knight in on e5. It is coming with the tempo, after all. Shirov has to cover both these pawns. He goes back to g2. Holding steady. Keeping calm for the, the moment. And, yeah, this position, already it looks great for Polgar. And uh, the thing, though, is that, you know, with one nice piece, one nice piece on e5, that isn't the end of the game. You're going to need more than one nice piece. And what Polgar realizes is that more than one nice knight, you could get two nice knights in the center. This knight has to come out somehow, but how is it going to do it? Knight g6, you know, that looks okay, but then they just play h4, our knight can't really go anywhere, and they're just going to steamroll us with h5. Meanwhile, don't even get me started on knight c6. Our bishop would really, really hate that over on b7, having its eyes completely shut again. So instead, Polgar first pushes this knight away with b4. The knight has to go to e2. Knight a4 would also be sort of a disaster. The knight goes to e2. And now Polgar meditates on this. How can she get the knight to f5? Can you see it? How's the knight going to get to f5? We do have this pin here, but for the moment, this g-pawn has to be distracted. h5. This is one of the most gorgeous moves I've ever seen. Already she's down a pawn, and she just throws another pawn into the woodworks. Immediately now, white has a choice of which g-pawn does he want to take with. If he takes this way, there should be many moves here. Already now these scores are getting more and more clear, and knight g6 is becoming stronger with the queen coming in. Bishop takes would also be super strong, though, because this bishop is probably white's best piece. Look at this bishop here. If we think about where white's pawns are, all of them are on light squares, meaning that this dark squared bishop is super valuable. It's super important. It's covering this litany of weak dark squares. And as soon as we trade it off, takes takes, these dark squares are gonna really start to burn, burn bright for the black pieces. Already now we can think of just putting the knight on g6, putting the queen on g5, digging into one of these squares. Black obviously has full compensation here. And this, not to mention just this bishop is beautiful. All of white's pieces are really, really hideous here. I would assume that this is already much better for black. Um, one of the really cool things, by the way, is that, you know, black's pieces are so good here, and we have such, uh, such a nice sort of shelter for our king, that the king does not need to move at all here. The king is happy in the center. It has a nice sort of pawn cover, keeping everything nice and steady. So instead, though, Shirov goes the other way. Shirov takes on h5 like this. Now Shirov's up two pawns. But... Our knights. Look at those knights. These are golden knights. These beautiful knights in the center. They're hitting so many squares here. How many squares are there? They must be hitting 16 squares. That's insane. 16 squares going all around the board. Look at this. Can you believe this? Look at this swath of territory. I tell all my students this. You want your knights in the outer center. You want your knights in this 16 square perimeter. This little blue 16 square zone because only on those 16 squares are the knights going to each hit eight squares. In this situation, the knights are hitting all these squares. They're so overperforming compared to white's knights. Look at white's knights. White's knights are both out of this zone here. It's changed to green. They're both out of this zone, and so those knights are only hitting six squares. Our knights are doing, what is that, 30% more work than, than the white knights? And not to mention, we're also hitting a lot more important squares here. Already the bishop is hanging. What is the bishop going to do? With this bishop pin combined, the position is getting very tense for white. Just like I said before, white cannot try to hold on to the bishop. I mean, here also knight g4 would be a problem, but even so, takes takes. Without this bishop here, the dark squares are going to really, really suffer. Um, just something like bishop g7 and, and getting through here. I really like the idea of even sacrificing, because the idea is once this takes happens, bishop h6 is going to make that diagonal burn bright. This is going to be beautiful for black. So instead, though, Shirov played bishop f2. Shirov kept everything steady, and it looks like, you know, for the moment he's holding on, as long as he can keep this bishop on the board, his dark scores aren't going to be that weak. And now Polgar plays a lightning bolt of a move. Queen takes g5. Isn't that stunning? It's beautiful. It's art. It's insane. It's one of, like, the best things I've ever seen in my life. I remember seeing this game as, like, a 13-year-old... And, um, yeah, this, this was just insane. Literally, if the queen takes, the knight comes to check, and will take back. The queen is completely safe here due to the knight fork. This pawn is hanging, and already we can see that, you know, if this were to happen, black is going to regain both her pawns. She's going to have this enormous central majority here. These pawns are also going to drop like apples, because those are super weak. This is already winning. It's, it's just so insane. I remember when I was, um... 
let me turn off these arrows. I remember when I was a kid, I was probably... I saw this in the Mammoth Book of World's Greatest Games. This game had an enormous impression on me. Uh, it's really cool to see this game now as a Grandmaster. I haven't seen this game in several years. Only recently, you know, just to prepare for this video, I re-looked at this. And I'm noticing some different things now. Now I'm starting to really appreciate just how essential these knights were. These knights are so strong here, and it, it's not just that they're strong. I'm sure we've seen other knights like this. It's more coupled by the fact that because white has pushed all the pawns, there are just so many weak squares in the white position here. Um, particularly these two on f3 and e3. And for that purpose, yeah, this the queen g5 move is just such a stunner. Look at that. The queen can't be taken because it just gets met with the knight fork. Meanwhile, what is white to do, though? This queen is just scanning the board. White can't even continue with the development. Like, normally in this position, you would want to just bring your king here, castle, you know, let let black trade. Black's already gotten a pawn back. Black will probably get a second pawn back, but at least maybe you'll survive. But there's literally nothing to do here. This is just a disastrous position now. White doesn't even really have any way to to do anything useful. White just has to wait out this queen sitting on this unbelievably annoying square. So instead, white plays knight a5. This is probably the only thing that white can do. He's trying to push the bishop away. If the bishop has to go back to c8, of course, white's gotten a big accomplishment, a big achievement. Can hang that on his wall, can put that on his... Uh, his um, what do they call that? What are those those uh what are those military uniforms? That's like a medal on his jacket. That's the word I'm looking for. So knight e3. Beautiful stuff. She doesn't even bother defending the bishop. She's attacking the queen, she's attacking the pawn. Queen takes g5, and now this is just mate. Have you ever seen anything like this? A mate in the middle of the board. With just two knights against against an entire white army. Yeah, I remember back in the day when I was looking at this game, this was the only thing that really stood out to me, that there was just this insanely cool tactic where the queen can't take because there's mate. But lo and behold, yeah, black had everything covered, and when we look deeper, we see that, you know, not there wasn't just this nice tactic, there was this really beautiful foundation here of tactics, of strategy, and all in all, she's just going for the dark squared bishop. She knows that if she can just dominate these diagonals, the, the win will be very easy. Technically, black is hanging a piece here. There's takes, takes, and the knight can take on b7, but of course, the game is just going to go belly up here. There's so many different ways to win on the dark squares. The most obvious is knight f3, king d1, and queen d2. Splat, the king is getting checkmated. But even something like bishop h6 would be disastrous for, for white here. Queen d2 is a threat, knight f3 is still a threat. The game should be over anyway. These dark squares are just way too weak. So queen g3... Sheriff holds off, steady hands, but now Polgar is just able to immediately convert and simplify into a very simple winning ending. Takes, takes, and she just crashes through on c2. This was another threat after all. This, you know, we were looking at all those fireworks with the knight on e3, covering d1, hitting g2, but the knight was also just threatening this very, this very beginner level knight fork. King d1, knight takes a1. Now the knight takes on b7. Things are still a bit tense here. Notice that, you know, for the moment, black is up the exchange, but this knight is trapped here. And so Polgar has to airlift it out. B3. The knight is going to get out one way or another. Knight could come to C2. Also, the pawn could just take on A2 and maybe even become a queen. And so Shirov didn't want to see that. He took. The knight takes. King C2. Knight C5. The knight gets out. Everything is safe. Takes, takes. And already, you know, Shirov could probably resign, but he didn't want to just uh, resign immediately. It's always a bit embarrassing for a Grandmaster to resign so early on. He probably just realized, he probably set a number in his head for how many more moves he was going to make before resigning. But, you know, against against someone as strong as Judah Polgar, 2700 plus level player, you're not, you're not going to come back this game. You're just down a full exchange here for absolutely nothing. The last thing I wanted to mention with this game that I really found beautiful, and something that I've definitely started to appreciate as a Grandmaster, is look at this pawn here on E4. This pawn is completely isolated, meaning there are lots of weak squares around it. I love the way that Polgar plays this. Perhaps this is just a matter of style, but you're going to see a lot of Grandmasters do this, where they find a weak pawn, and then they just put all of their pieces around it. So what we're going to see her do is she's going to use all of these squares, more or less. Maybe not f4, but she's going to use the others, just to place her pieces on in very secure fashion, and really just completely dominate and occupy the center. Knight f3, bishop c3, knight d4 check, the knight comes in. King d3, bishop d6, 
Bishop attacks the knight. Uh, of course, white could take on d4, but after takes, king takes, this this game is just completely over. This pawn should be lost very soon. Something like king e7, rook g8, and already there's threats of bishop g3 and rook g3. There's threats of bishop g3 and rook h5. Too, too many issues to count. Instead, Sheriff plays bishop g2, and now Polgar places the bishop on the treehouse. I call these scores treehouse when they're in between pawns of opposite colors. It's a special type of outpost. The white pawn is protecting us from the frontal attacks by the rook. This pawn, on the other hand, is protecting us from side attacks by the rook. And overall, these are the perfect places for bishops. You always want to think about your bishops like snipers. Snipers love treehouses. Snipers do not want to be fighting in close combat with the other soldiers. And the game the game just ended pretty much immediately. The game completely petered out to, to a very simple position. King c4, king e7. This king could take here, but only at enormous cost. There's going to be something like check, king b4, check, king a4, and... I mean, there should be several wins here. Um, something like check, king a3, knight c2, and king a2 takes, takes, rook a4 is mate. Shirov probably saw all these things super fast. He was an extremely strong player, and for that reason, he just chose to throw in the towel. One more move was played, rook a1, the knight comes back to c6. Simplifications are already happening. This beautiful bishop, which was surveying the whole board from a treehouse, is going to be traded, but at the same time, a knight is just going to take its place. Another beautiful knight in the treehouse. Definitely as I've gotten better, I've started to appreciate Grandmasters really love this treehouse with uh, with putting a knight in between two opposite colored pawns. It's really a gorgeous strategy. The knight sits very comfortably. It sits very hidden. And yeah, this was a beautiful game. So I hope you enjoyed this game. Um, yeah, like I said before, it's really interesting to see this game again as a Grandmaster. I have not seen this game for literally 15 years. I've definitely picked up some new appreciations of it. Back in the day as a kid, I just liked the idea of, oh, the queen's hanging. I was thinking about the queen being hanging all that time, and that's what had made an impression on me. But now going back, it turns out just, you know, that there's an underlying logic to everything. It reminds me of that quote about how, you know, when you read a book twice, you don't see something new in it, you see something new in yourself. And I think that that's true here. And what I mean by that is that it's not the, the game that's changed at all. It's my own play that's changed. And in doing that, I'm able to see a lot of new things. I'm able to appreciate a lot of new nuances that my, nor, my, my newer, more modern, uh, more sophisticated awareness is able to show me. So on that note, I bid you adieu, and I hope to see you at the next video.